Um, good morning, everyone. My name is Christian Burrish, and I'm the core coordinator for the Professional Development Corps of the Dakota Community Collaborative on Translational Activity. And I'd like to welcome you all to April's edition of the Clinical Translational Research Webinar Series. We hold these every month. And if you'd like to subscribe to our listserv to be informed of when these monthly webinars are being released and being scheduled, I'll put a link for our Pathfinder portal in chat momentarily uh, before. Without further ado, I'd like to hand things off to today's speaker, Dr. Sean Grant, who will talk to us about open science today. Dr. Grant, it's nice to have you today. Christian, thanks so much for inviting me and for hosting me. And uh, thank you, everyone, for your time today, either in live or in uh, the recorded land of looking back at this at a future date. Really excited to provide an introduction to open science practices for you all. So quick introduction. My name is Sean Grant. I'm a research associate professor at the University of Oregon. A lot of my research over the last 10 years has focused in part on the role of transparency and reproducibility in identifying evidence-based interventions that we should then translate into policy and practice applications in our healthcare systems, our community settings, our school settings, anywhere else where we think we can improve collective well-being. So the goal of today is to introduce and provide an overview of open science practices for folks for whom this might be a new topic. And so the topics in this webinar are gonna include factors motivating interest in transparency and reproducibility, research practices that are associated with open science, and stakeholders who are engaged in and impacted by open science reform efforts. In addition, we'll discuss how and why different types of research can incorporate open science practices and conclude with activities that aim to strengthen the reliability and efficiency of translational science, facilitate access to translational science products and outputs, and promote collaborative and inclusive participation in research activities. So open science, let's first define the term, aims to make the scientific process both public and auditable, and to ensure the free availability and usability of our scientific knowledge. Examples of prominent open science practices related to transparent and reproducible workflows include things like registering our studies and prospectively sharing protocols and analysis plans, sharing data analytic methods and other research materials, reporting and disclosing all of our study methods and findings, and disseminating our research outputs via open access outlets. And as awareness and support of these practices has increased in recent years, conversations in most disciplines have started to evolve from whether open science should be the norm to how we should implement transparent, open, and reproducible research practices. And I think some things that are worth noting are the White House Office of Science and Technology, uh, Technology Policy issuing guidance and new policies to advance open and equitable research. Namely, they're asking everyone to immediately make their articles public access, open access upon publication, and the data that are underlying those articles if there is any federal funding received for the work that was done in those articles. And I believe it's by the end of 2025 that institutes that fund research need to comply with this policy. NIH is already working through these things, for example, with its data sharing policy. And the federal government has actually called 2023 the year of open science because of these multi-agency initiatives across the federal government to spark and change and inspire open science engagement. And there are numerous events and activities that are going on if you want to check out open.science.gov open for more. It's a very active year. And the first thing I want to go over are some motivations for those who are advocates for open science practices. So one of them is that it helps align scientific practice with scientific ideals. The belief is that transparency, openness, and reproducibility are inherent in our fundamental scientific ideals like communality, universalism, disinterestedness, and organized skepticism. And so these are a list of norms that have been developed by sociologists of science since the mid 20th century, and they identify norms that scientists tend to ascribe to. There's even empirical surveys that have been done over the last decade indicating that scientists do believe and aspire to these ideals. 
but then they highlight them against counter norms, which are actually more common in our scientific practice than what we actually do, as opposed to the ideals that we aspire to. So for example, we might aspire to communality, openly sharing our new findings with colleagues, but we are sometimes incentivized by our scientific ecosystem for secrecy, protecting our newest findings to ensure that we get priority in publishing and patenting in our applications. Many scientists subscribe to universalism. We evaluate research on its own merit according to accepted standards in our field, but particularism is common. We assess new knowledge and its applications based on the reputation and past productivity of the individual scientists or the research group, as opposed to the study on its own merit. Many scientists say they ascribe to disinterestedness. We're motivated by the desire for knowledge and discovery, not by the possibility of personal gain. But there are incentives for self-interestedness in the career of science, where we compete with others in the same field for funding and recognition of our achievements. And then lastly, organized skepticism is the ideal that we consider all new evidence, hypotheses, theories, and innovations, even those that may challenge or contradict our own work. But again, we're incentivized sometimes towards organized dogmatism, investing our careers and promoting our own most important findings, theories, or innovations. And open science practices can better enable norms over counter norms, like verifiability, the ability to self-correct. The, the scientific community governs itself in order to calibrate our evidentiary claims and limit unavoidable errors, thereby safeguarding credibility and instilling trust in the scientific literature. Because verifiability requires researchers to provide empirical support for our scientific claims, practices like registering our studies in advance and sharing our data enable that verifiability of our empirical evidence. So open science bolsters research integrity by facilitating this verifiability. And so as researchers increasingly espouse the ideals of norms on the left column, making open science practices the norm could better align our actual scientific practice with the ideals to which we as scientists say we subscribe. Another motivation is that open science can accelerate the progress of scientific discovery and science is a cumulative enterprise. So transparency and reproducibility facilitate reuse and building on the work of others, leading to greater returns on research investments. For example, openness enables collaborations that might not be possible through siloed research, such as crowdsourced initiatives that build large data sets to create opportunities for a greater number of rich data analyses. The Psychological Science Accelerator is one such distributed global laboratory network where there are numerous folks who have signed up to help collect data all over the world for questions that have been prioritized as critical for the field of psychological science. Data sharing also yields greater power to investigate new or more complex questions. So intervention effects on rare outcomes, subgroup effects, mediation of effects that require larger sample sizes than we typically find in one study. And then adopting the protocols and software and analytic strategies from previous studies by our, our own institutes or perhaps by institutes in our field can increase standardization in our field, facilitating more efficient discoveries and research syntheses like systematic reviews and meta-analyses that summarize the cumulative evidence within a specific line of scientific inquiry. And right now, if we're only sharing manuscripts, that makes that a lot more difficult compared to when we might also openly share protocols and materials and intervention manuals, anything else that was created with public funds like NIH funding. And then one final um, motivation for the open science movement is making research products and outputs more usable and freely available to everyone, which can broaden access to scientific knowledge and scientific resources. For example, there are disparities in financial, human, and physiological and physical resources across research institutions that can be mitigated if our protocols, our data, our code, our software, our materials from previous research are freely available and free for folks to reuse. In addition, open access journal articles can be read online or downloaded freely by stakeholders who are not affiliated with universities or other research institutions that have journal subscriptions. 
And so if we're thinking about the role of non-governmental organizations, of policymakers, of engaged members of the public in our translational research, these paywalls are a significant barrier for folks to have access to knowledge. And if knowledge is power, this is broadening access, this is limiting the access to power, the emancipatory power that scientific knowledge can have. And so through this focus on free availability of research findings and products, open science can accelerate the flow of scientific evidence to the public. Now, while these are, I think, really important positive motivations to flag, one reason why open science is also getting a lot of attention or has gotten a lot of attention over the last decade or so are these concerns about the credibility of findings that come from closed science being the norm. And this is because researchers make numerous decisions across all stages of our research or what is sometimes known as the research life cycle. So we make decisions about the kinds of questions we're gonna ask, about our study design, about the data we're gonna collect and how we're gonna analyze it, and then how we're gonna report and disseminate what we found. And without transparency, researchers have undisclosed flex flexibility in making these decisions. These are sometimes called researcher degrees of freedom, kind of akin to degrees of freedom in statistics. And the concern is that these enable numerous detrimental research practices that also motivate the open science movement. For example, a closed research life cycle hinders the ability to reproduce previous findings. It facilitates selective reporting of studies and results. So things like publication bias and outcome reporting bias, and it prevents the detection of unintentional errors as well as intentional misconduct. And as a result, all of these things can exacerbate perverse incentives for career scientists because if folks know these things won't get caught and these things lead to more publications and more publications are good for one's career, closed science can actually be something that enables a culture and environment that many scientists say they wish didn't exist, but fear that they have to live within. They have to play the game. And in particular, over the last decade, scientists and other stakeholders have started to contend that the behavioral, social, and health sciences are experiencing what's sometimes called a reproducibility crisis. Sometimes it's called the replication crisis or the credibility crisis, or the positive framing is the credibility revolution. These all might be terms you've heard. And underlying these are numerous large-scale collaborative efforts to try to reproduce the findings in influential top-tier journals in various fields. And all of these found lower rates than the folks in the field expected them to find. So while there's some debate as to what the right reproducibility rate should be, folks in these fields who do these exercises tend to be very surprised by the inability to reproduce significant effects, as well as the shrinking of effect sizes from the original study to the replication study. And while this irreproducibility can occur for substantive reasons, like differences in populations between the studies, scientific stakeholders are concerned that the number of key research findings that cannot be reproduced is higher than expected because of detrimental research practices from closed science. And one of the reasons that they fear this after these studies is that many of these studies tried to follow to the T to directly replicate the original study, sometimes in collaboration with the original researchers to make sure that they got the workflow from the previous study correct and implemented it as directly as possible in the replication study. And so if we view the ability to reproduce findings like this as one indicator, just one of many, but an important indicator potentially for the veracity of a scientific claim, these results are commonly taken now as evidence that a greater proportion of published research findings are likely false than has previously been believed. And this can hinder scientific pro progress, it can delay translation of research into policy and practice applications, it can lead to waste of resources, for example, lines of research that were based off of a false positive, or lines of translational work that are based off of interventions deemed evidence-based that maybe aren't. And this as a whole can threaten the reputation of and public trust in science if we as a community that ascribes to self-correction doesn't do something about this as evidence accumulates that these kinds of problems are prominent, they're not uncommon, and they have very serious detrimental effects on the credibility of our work. 
And so while there are various determinants of these e-producible findings, again, common detrimental research practices may be important contributors. So let's dive into what some of these practices are that are associated with closed science. The so one is underspecified methods where folks don't provide enough detail about the methods and their analytic plan to allow other scientists to critically appraise their findings. A big one is reporting bias where either scientists decide not to write up specific analyses or outcomes or journals decide not to accept for publication studies with specific analyses and outcomes and it's because of the nature of the results and the narrative, like results not being statistically significant, rather than judging the quality of a study based off of the importance of the question, the appropriateness of the methods to answer that question, and how rigorously those methods were executed in a given study. Related to this is this concern about data dredging, data mining, uh, if you use null hypothesis significance testing, it's sometimes called p-hacking. And this is where you repeatedly search your data set or you try alternative analyses like different covariates or different ways of handling outliers until a result is found. And it's the result that makes you think, oh, okay, this is the most appropriate analysis I should stop. And in particular, when you're using statistical significance as the criterion to stop. And then one last category, as I mentioned a few slides ago, is just human error, right? I mean, we're humans, we're fallible, and sometimes we make technical errors like accidentally coding the treatment group as a control group, so our findings, we interpret them the opposite of what was actually the case. Or if we don't have reproducible workflows, perhaps we're copying and pasting things from Excel or SBSS or Stata or R into our Word documents and our PowerPoint slides. And maybe we just make copy and paste mistakes, which are very, you know, I can empathize with those, they're very understandable from a human perspective, but they nonetheless have detrimental consequences on the credibility of what we disseminate. And the belief by folks who have looked into the prevalence and motivation behind these practices is that, yeah, maybe some researchers do these things with full knowledge of their negative consequences, but perhaps many researchers are, are doing these things unknowingly or under the belief that these practices are detrimental, right? They're acceptable, they're normal, and so therefore they must be compatible with research integrity. After all, this is how I learned to do things in grad school. But regardless of intention or understanding, these practices have detrimental effects on research integrity by inflating the false positive error rate in our research literature, amongst other issues. And unfortunately, evidence suggests that many of these practices are not only common, but they might be increasing over time if we don't do something about them. And I'd say chief among these that really concerns a lot of folks who are active in the open science movement is publication bias, is selectively reporting entire studies or perhaps specific results within a study, which occurs when the nature of the study findings rather than the methodological rigor is influencing those decisions on what to publish and what to disseminate. There is pretty ample evidence and longstanding evidence across many disciplines that statistically significant or positive results are more likely to be published than results that are not statistically significant, that are negative or null or inconclusive or otherwise you know, countervailing to what might've been expected in advance. And researchers themselves may be the ones who selectively refrain from writing up and submitting these results or studies because they think that it's not worth their time because they perceive that important journals in their field won't be interested in these results. And sometimes it might be as a result of the decision of peer reviewers or journal editors. But this study showed, for example, that amongst 220 social science experiments that were registered in advance, where they had to share the results, but the main mechanism for null results not being published is that over half of the authors of those experiments with null results just didn't write them up. They didn't think it was worth doing. And so how can we correct either those perceptions if they're inaccurate or the incentives if they were correct in perceiving things that way? In medicine and wider health sciences, there's been meta-research indicating that interventional trials with statistically non-significant results are less likely to be published than clinical trials with statistically significant results. Uh, the National Institute of Mental Health had an evaluation of their trials that they funded, and that found that studies with small effects were less likely to be published than studies with large effects. 
So it's not just statistical significance, effect size might also be something here. And then that can inflate the apparent effectiveness of interventions that we're trying to translate into practices um, in the real world, in our actual healthcare systems. And this undisclosed flexibility from closed science is related to other detrimental research practices that virtually guarantee that we seriously find statistically significant or interesting results. So I mentioned things like data dredging and p-hacking, and we want to try and identify the source of each of these detrimental practices across the research life cycle. Is it related to the questions that we're posing? Is it related to how we design and conduct our research? Is it related to how research is regulated and managed? Is it related to access to our full reports? And then is it related to the information that we contain in our reports to make them usable and unbiased? And so getting to the next part of the presentation, in response to this reproducibility or replication or credibility crisis, the open science movement is seen as representing part of what some call a credibility revolution by promoting standards and norms that increase the reliability of scientific research. It's one of many of these scientific reform movements, but it's one that aims to promote a shift from traditionally closed to more open research life cycles. And so to achieve this shift, open science proponents commonly advocate for a core set of practices. And it's important to note though, that this set of core practices has largely come from idealized versions of science that think that science is synonymous with the experiment with the hypothetical deductive scientific method. So things like randomized trials and lab experiments that test confirmatory analyses using things like null hypothesis significance testing. And so we want to note that while these principles of transparency and openness, I think can be relevant to all empirical research, if you're doing research other than a trial or an experiment, I think it would be with, within one's rights, it would be logical to check and make sure a given practice is relevant to their area of research. And if you think it's not, what's the underlying open science principle behind things like study registration or having an organized workflow and file management? And is there a way to adapt the principle more appropriately to your context? So while I might focus at least for the next couple slides on things like trials and experiments that have really push this movement along, you know, happy to, particularly in the question and answer, talk through any questions you might have about other methods that you might be using in your workflows. So the first set of standards relates to things that you're doing as you're designing your study. And a key one is study registration. So this is a timestamped entry of a minimum set of information about your study that you register in a publicly accessible but independently controlled registry. So it's not something you control, it's something that someone else controls so that folks can have confidence that the information you put in there is not something that you're altering and saying, oh yeah, we said this five years ago, but it's actually something you've just updated. And ideally researchers register studies before collecting new data or accessing existing data sets if you're doing secondary data analysis. And in terms of some of the practices, the detrimental practices we covered earlier, this in part aims to address publication bias by just documenting that particular studies exist. And then your registration number, for example, your number in clinicaltrials.gov can also serve as something like an identification number for your study. And you can use that to link your various products and outputs of your study. So not just your manuscripts, but protocols, your data, your code, your research materials. You can all cite the registration number and that helps someone else understand the web of products that have come from your study because your study has that identification number. So in this way, a study registration can act as a one-stop shop for other researchers and interested stakeholders to discover and gather information on planned, current, and completed research on a topic, even if that research never was published in a journal article because the registration number is there. Related to this are your study protocols and analysis plans. So a protocol is a document that details your study background, rationale, your objectives, your design, and your methods. And then your analysis plan provides a more technical and detailed elaboration of the procedures that you'll use to execute the analysis described in your protocol. 
And you can register, publish, or share these documents in advance of data collection and analysis in order to pre-specify things like your rationale, your proposed methods, and your analysis plan. And so this helps to address concerns about selective reporting of specific results, so specific outcomes, specific measures, specific time points or ways of running your analysis in a manuscript. So not just that publication bias, but other forms of selective reporting. Now, this doesn't prevent exploratory analyses. It's supposed to limit opportunities for switching primary and secondary outcomes, selective reporting, by facilitating others to identify what you planned versus what you actually did, but they allow you to still do exploratory analyses. You're just being more transparent about which ones were planned in advance and which ones were done after the fact. I think another positive consequence of, of writing out protocols and analysis plans is that they can encourage research teams to more carefully plan in advance when you have to write it down and you have to share it. And I think they also help research teams conduct the study. So if you have a large team with different types of stakeholders in your translational research, the more that you're writing out your protocol and analysis plan in advance, the more easy it is to communicate with the various members of your research team, because you have that written document that you might iterate on and share over time. But sometimes that written word is a lot clearer or it reveals things that you thought were clear to the team, but actually weren't if they were just based off of Zoom meetings or phone meetings. And the NIH provides protocol templates for folks in uh, both more biomedical disciplines and those who might be more in the behavioral and social sciences. So you Google their clinical trials protocol templates, I think that's a great place to start. Now, as we move towards specific practices um, for conducting the study, I think I can just bundle them all in what I'd call a transparent and reproducible and organized workflow. And this may seem kind of trite, um, but it's actually really terribly important for running a good study. And these are things like how you organize your folders and your files and your metadata, so information on your data, how organized your code is for analyses and any other documentation that allow you to coherently manage your files and your procedures clearly. So this, roof, this reproducible workflow includes things like clear computing and communication, version control that tracks changes in real time across collaborators and versions. So you're not worried about different versions of Word docs or code or anything like that. It tracks the chronology and origin of research objects, so your data or source code. It ideally, if you've got the capability, uses maximum programmatic automation and minimal manual file edits to prevent things like copy and paste errors that we talked about. And then there's also an increasing push to use these things um, that help contain your computational environment so that if, for example, the R code that you've used changes in the future, it shares the environment, it shares the code that, uh, the version of your code at the time you ran those analyses, and then any other packages that were your code was dependent on, which sometimes can be lost in the future. And then ideally, you'd maintain some kind of dynamic that is iterative living research notebook where you record decisions that you've made throughout your study. And then perhaps this is something that you can publicly share when your study's done, but at a minimum, future you will really appreciate you taking those notes along the way and referencing back to you as you're finally writing up studies or communicating to external audiences why you made specific decisions, perhaps changes to the protocol at a given point in time. As you're getting to disseminating your findings, a really core thing to do is to transparently report your study accurately and completely. And this is because incomplete reporting leads to the omission of information that's essential to appraise study quality, to reproduce findings, and to synthesize a body of evidence in systematic reviews and meta-analyses and other kinds of research entities. And so there's been this initiative over the last 30 years or so to develop reporting guidelines. So things that have followed an explicit method to provide standards for a field on the minimum set of information to include in your manuscripts. So these reporting standards tend to be organized in a checklist of things to report in your title, your abstract, your introduction, your methods, your results, your discussion, maybe things to share in your online supplementary materials, and then diagrams to capture the flow of participants through your studies. 
The Equator Network, run out of the University of Oxford, is the largest international live, uh, initiative that provides a living library of reporting guidelines for various study designs. Um, so folks who've, uh, who've developed and run Equator have been involved with consort guidelines for randomized trials or PRISMA guidelines for systematic reviews, if you're familiar with either of those. But as you can see from their main page, they also highlight the main reporting guidelines for other types of studies like qualitative research. And then if you go to their library, you can see and search for the full list of guidelines that they've identified. And folks register guidelines they're developing with Equator, so it really does a great job, I think, of staying up to date of high quality reporting guidelines in health research. Then you also want to think about at the end of your study how you're going to archive or share outputs other than your manuscripts, like data, code, and research materials. So sharing analytic data sets with relevant metadata, code, and your materials facilitates reproducibility. To safeguard the quality of these things, you should carefully plan and describe your management procedures at the beginning of a study, make those procedures accessible to the research team during the study, and communicate these procedures to external stakeholders after your study. Data that's relevant for sharing can range from study to study from the initial raw data to the final process data set. And there are guidelines and standards available. The NIH in particular offers a lot of them for how to manage these things so that your data code and materials are findable, they're accessible, they're interoperable, and they're reusable, but they also are sensitive to any legal, ethical, or proprietary constraints you have in sharing these materials. And then the NIH also provides lists of different repositories where you can archive your materials. There are some generic ones that anyone in any field can use, but then they also list specific repositories that might be more tailored to your discipline if you're working within a very specific field that has very unique standards. So what does this look like for particular types of research? I'll, I'll highlight a few different types of research and some examples of, uh, the, for example, the different checklists that you could use in these, these types of research. So one, let's start with epidemiological research is investigating the distribution and causes of physical, mental, and social health problems amongst your population. And this kind of research may be at greater risk of things like multiple hypothesis testing and selective reporting because of the increased capacity to fit really complex models, perhaps you're using pre-existing data. And so these, these provide the opportunity perhaps for being at greater risk for some of those detrimental research practices that we talked about. So if you're doing this kind of research, you can use project management systems like the Open Science Framework. That would provide you a free, open, and online platform to have that kind of organized workflow, to manage your files, to share your notebooks. And the Open Science Framework is interoperable with a lot of tools that are probably in your workflow. So this is, can be a place where you sort of coherently condense and make a one-stop shop for your research team and any other external stakeholders who might be interested in your workflow when your study's done. And then there are also reporting guidelines that are specific to this type of research. For example, STROBE, Strengthening the Reporting of Observational Studies in Epidemiology, is a specific guideline for observational studies of which most epidemiological research consists. The development and testing of interventions is also a really fundamental area to think about. And from an open science perspective, this is where study registration and transparent reporting really become essential. So you'd wanna register your trial, for example, in clinicaltrials.gov to record important information about the design of your trial, things like complete and transparent definitions of all of your planned outcome measures. And this is applicable, at least according to the NIH, with all studies that prospectively assign human participants to one or more interventions. All of those kinds of studies, including behavioral and social interventions, they expect them to be registered, regardless of phase, setting, intervention, or outcome. And then there are also reporting guidelines, namely the Consolidated Standards for Reporting or the Consort Guidelines, to make sure that you develop a very comprehensive, accurate, and transparent report of what you found in your study. And the consort guidelines are accompanied by what they call explanation and elaboration documents. They call them E&E documents. They're essentially user's manuals that for each item in the checklist, 
provide an example of how to adhere to that checklist, so how to report some information in your study manuscripts, and then it provides the rationale underlying that standard. So you get an understanding of why it's important to report a given piece of information. Translational research can also intersect with public policy. So insights from epidemiological and interventional research inform real world policies and practices that promote individual and collective well being. And at this stage, we're not only talking about researchers within academic institutions. But there are individuals in healthcare systems and government agencies and nonprofits and other settings that we need to think about. For example, we need to think about the inaccessibility of journal articles due to paywalls. And so I think at this stage, open information systems become really critical in building and using knowledge management to advance dissemination and implementation of our science. So you might want to think about publishing articles open access or sharing preprints with your institutional servers or preprint servers like those run by the Open Science Framework so that anyone who wants to consume your research can do so without having to deal with a paywall. Community-based participatory research entails unique challenges and opportunities for transparency and openness. Given the openness and sharing of power structures with non-scientists, the use of a broader range of research methods, Think growing concerns about privacy and confidentiality as folks are engaged not just with uh, having data collected on them, but in the whole research process. And then perhaps unstructured data that would be really helpful to use, like data from meetings with non-researchers who are part of your research team. And I think this is a good example of where principles of open science really come into play. So the forward planning and transparency that are demanded by open science they might initially seem like they're anathema to those working in CBPR, but they can improve your capacity for ongoing communication, for transparency and accountability with your non-researcher stakeholders and partners, and even reciprocity in relationships with community stakeholders as you're thinking about sharing information with them, not just at the end, but throughout the whole study. And so I think it's important for us to engender conversations about ethics, and these types of, of these types of community-based participatory research projects, and I'd love to hear from folks who are working in this space and thinking about ways to provide explicit guidance on the use of open science to offer a structure for establishing agreements about key expectations, about workflows, about data sharing, about dissemination. You know, any ways that these principles of being transparent and open can actually facilitate better CVPR. Some of you might be working in qualitative research, and I think this is another really exciting area for applications of open science. As I mentioned earlier, a lot of these practices come from experimental frameworks, and those frameworks have different types of criterion for what makes good science compared to qualitative research, where validity means something different, but then we also care about things like reflexivity and traceability. And so rather than being used to establish predictions, maybe open science practices like registration could help define the aims of a project, maybe outline one's positionality and their presuppositions going into the project. They can be updated as data are collected and analyzed to track and allow others to trace the development of your coding structure, your interpretive framework, and then can also combat dissemination biases in the qualitative literature. So maybe there is something about the nature of results that influences decisions to write up results or for journals to accept results in qualitative research. That's referred to as dissemination biases instead of publication bias. And so being open might be able to combat some of those issues. You might also be able to share your materials like your memos and your code books, information on iterator reliability, if that's relevant to the type of qualitative research that you do. And then maybe thinking about new ways of, of creating data management plans to share the various types of data, like photos, audio recordings, transcripts, and field notes in an ethically and legally appropriate manner. And I think ethics it really comes into play here, as often qualitative research can involve really personal, personally identifiable information. It can involve sensitive information. And so sharing of these things, if at all possible, if it's not, the the privacy and confidentiality of participants comes first 
but folks in these spaces are thinking about things like restricted access to data. So it's, it's shared and held by somebody so that you know the researcher, if they lose it, it's not gone, but there might be really stringent criteria that allows someone to actually gain access to that data for reuse or for reanalysis. And then lastly, you might be using administrative data. This involves information that organizations routinely collect to monitor and evaluate how other operations achieve their intended goals. And the decreasing costs of obtaining big data sets combined with improved technology for data analysis make this kind of research easier to conduct over time. And while this is great for higher powered analyses, much like epidemiological research, it also risks furious findings if multiple results are analyzed and produced, but they're not all reported completely and accurately in our final products. So we think that it's important for folks working in this space to adhere to things like transparent reporting, but then in addition, you could gain efficiency and accuracy in your research processes by leveraging principles of open science like organized workflows and open source software and having really organized folders and file structures that describe each folder in sufficient detail for another researcher to understand what's in those folders, how to reproduce any analyses, you know, which data is raw versus process, things of that nature. And then in particular, projects in R Studio, if, if you're familiar with the R programming language, can provide an excellent starting point for anyone new to this to build reproducible workflows. And they're easily extendable to other collaborative and interactive programmatic tools like web applications, like our shiny interactive applications. If those are things you're developing to help translate research findings for policy and practice, real world context. So the last thing I want to cover before going into Q&A are st other stakeholders in the scientific ecosystem besides researchers. So as I've mentioned earlier, incentives for academic research have become increasingly perverse, unfortunately, over the last several decades because of our hyper-competitive research environment. And at times it's focus on productivity and novelty and innovation over things like verifiability and replication and the credibility of our findings. Competition for publications, for research funding, for media coverage, and for permanent employment can incentivize some detrimental research practices if those practices allow one to get more publications, which can lead to more funding, which can lead to more media coverage, which can lead to more permanent uh, positions in the scientific ecosystem. And some folks may have heard of this referred to as the publish or perish or the funding or famine culture. And it's possible that this in combination with closed research life cycles is a key determinant of things like false positive rates, irreproducible results, inflated effect size estimates, detrimental research practices in the scientific literature. So as a consequence, it's important not just to think about ourselves if we're individual researchers and how to improve our workflows, but to think about our roles in organizations and or the influence we might have in our networks to make sure that our ecosystem has virtuous cycles that promote appropriate applications of open science and the hopes that this can fight against some of these detrimental incentives. So one example are what journals and publishers can do. And a key framework here is the transparency and openness promotion guidelines. These provide standards that journals can incorporate into their policies and procedures. So helping journals come up with things like policies on study registration, on sharing data, on sharing materials. And then journals can award things like these open science badges to flag to the reader that these practices have been enacted in a given study. And then there's a whole new publishing format that's being promoted called registered reports. This is a two-stage submission where the protocol is reviewed by a journal prior to conducting the research. And then if that passes peer review, the stage two report, which is what we're used to submitting, the version of the report with the results, that has in principle acceptance at that journal, so long as the authors either conform to the protocol that was approved or transparently report deviations from that protocol and the journal finds those defensible. 
And so in addition to addressing publication biases, this model is also trying to provide feedback at the protocol stage, right? You get peer review at study design where it might actually be helpful and you might be more open to it rather than at this stage where you're almost seeing this as a combative relationship and you're trying to prove why you don't need to go back and do certain things because the study is done and you need to get on with the next study. And then journals and publishers can also engage with the open access movement of making things free to read. And I think here, one sort of pernicious development are really expensive article processing charges, including by journals that also still charge for subscriptions. And these can be really expensive. So either unaffordable for some researchers like junior researchers or significantly impacting the budget of research teams or their funders without really changing the wider system. And so thinking about things like gold open access or diamond open access that doesn't really involve high APC charges to researchers, or should we move towards sharing the Word doc versions that maybe aren't typeset, um, so they're not as fancy for the reader, but at least there's a free version out there. And preprint servers that also accept these post prints, so the version that's accepted but not typeset by the journal, things like open science servers actually can link your post print with the published article in Google Scholar. So when folks search for your article, there's a little button on the side that says, Here's the free version, the Word doc version. And so that's another way without paying APCs to make your stuff open access. There is a lot of talk about what funders can do. The Open Research Funders Group is a great place to go to if you're interested in the role of funders. And um, as I mentioned, the NIH, which I think is probably really important for this group, is instituting policies related to open access publishing, sharing of data, and registration of what they define clinical trials to be. There's a lot of work on what universities and research institutions can do. Uh, being US-based, I highly recommend you look at this new initiative called Helios. It's an offshoot of a National Academy's roundtable on how to align incentives in scientific careers with open science principles and practices. They particularly involved influential folks at R1 institutions across the US. This is the initiative following up on that to try and make the recommendations of that panel a reality. So it's very likely that there are folks at your institution who are involved with Helios and they could be a great group to collaborate with to provide guidance for your campuses, for your institutions, or to find out perhaps policies or expectations that are coming your way and start to prepare for them. I want to flag that I've done some work on um, how this intersects with policymakers and practitioners. In my space, uh, there are these things called evidence clearing houses, like blueprints for healthy youth development, that somewhat similar to the FDA, identify which social and behavioral interventions are considered evidence-based for translation into real-world practice. And so we've been working with them to figure out how open science practices can be incorporated into their standards and procedures for identifying evidence-based interventions for translation into real-world contexts. And then uh, lastly, public engagement with science is growing. Um, in addition to CDPR, which we covered earlier, there's a growing emphasis in citizen science. So we're actually involving citizens, lay folks, in, for example, collection of data that through their involvement might be even easier to get. Um, so if you're curious about that, there are some great groups like uh, this Prevention Center at the University of Sydney that have done some work on citizen science. And then Sense About Science has a lot of great standards on how to incorporate these kinds of meta-scientific concerns in media conversation about science in scientific journalism. So with that being said, uh, I hope that this was a helpful introduction to you all. And be it through expectations from NIH and or your own agreement that practices and principles like openness and transparency are important. I wanted to end with highlighting that there are groups who provide guidance on how to foster communities of folks who support open science at specific institutions. And I found having that kind of community 
is really important for um, finding new developments in the space. Perhaps when you brush up against folks who are a bit skeptical of open science, you've got folks who are part of this community who sort of have your back and offer you support. And it's just a great way to sustain these practices over time. So last resource for you to look at. And with that, Christian, I'm happy to take any questions that anybody might have. Um, so if you have them today, happy to discuss them. Otherwise, I'm on Twitter. Feel free to shoot me an email at any time. I love talking about this stuff and you can find out some more work that I've done on open science on the website. So thanks so much for your time and keen to hear what questions or comments you have. Uh, any questions at all? Uh, if uh, there are no questions, I'd like to go ahead and wrap things up this morning. I see a hand raise. Uh, Michelle. I think it's the clap, but. Yeah, actually, I was just clapping. <laughs> it was very valuable. Thank you so much, Sean. It was great. Thank you, Michelle. I appreciate it. Uh, hands and clapping. I get those mixed up sometimes. Um, it's like uh, Dr. Rizvani. Thank you so much for the great talk. I was just wondering that uh, I know that we recorded, but uh, is there any possibility to have the slides uh, presented today? Yeah, absolutely. I'm already planning on sharing those with Christian, so feel free to take a look at those after to share them with anybody in your networks. And again, if you have questions after the fact that are more specific to projects you have going or things you might want to develop for the wider field, very happy to chat at any time. So not a one and done. Feel free to reach out. Perfect. That would be great. I, I definitely come to you with some questions. <laughs> okay, great. <laughs> Uh, yes, I will uh, publish the recording and the slides to our Pathfinder learning portal, and that will be issued out uh, sometime today at the latest. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you all so much for your time. I appreciate it. Uh, and if that's uh, all the time we have for today, if there are no further questions, I myself would like to thank everyone for coming out, and I wish you all a happy Taco Tuesday in the central time zone. <laughs> Enjoy five minutes before the next meeting for coffee and uh, refreshment. <laughs> Bye. Cheers. Have a good day.